Okay, this is my second attempt at recording this video because I'm dumb and forgot to turn on my microphone for the first take. So yeah, what's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. Today, I am going to be talking about Pokemon that live in the shadow of their not fully evolved previous forms. So, this is going to be more of a video for mid-range players and lower range players. I know that a lot of high skill players would be like, yeah, I already know all this, but I figured, you know, sometimes I can't appeal to the high level players. I want to appeal to people that are learning as well. So if you already know all this, maybe just sit back, relax, leave, leave a like in the video and leave this on to some noise because it'll also be some opinions I have on the on the higher level evolutions or the, the fully evolved forms. So yeah, if you guys enjoy, leave a like, subscribe to the channel and answer my comment question of the day, which is going to be, what Pokemon do you think lives in the shadow of its not fully evolved form the most? Which one do you think just has no chance of getting out of that shadow, regardless of what niche you might find? Let me know. Let's go ahead and get into it. So we're going to start off by talking about the not fully evolved form and then the fully evolved form and then explaining the difference between the two and just talking about why you know, what it could do to possibly get out of that shadow, uh, or if it just has no chance. So let's start off with Dusclops. Now, Dusclops is one of the most iconic Pokemon in all of Sword and Shield VGC, not just 2021, but 2020 as well. And even in some previous formats, because it has been viable with Eviolite, obviously. So what does Dusclops do? Well, Dusclops is mainly known for its ability to set up Trick Room and eat hits like nothing else. Like, this thing has absurd bulk with 40 HP, 130 defense, and 130 special defense without Eviolite already boosting it. Like, if you put Eviolite on top of that after the investment and stuff, it hits insane numbers. Because Eviolite gives it a 50% boost, this thing, you know, relaxed, max defense, 200 defense, right? 50% boost on top of that. It hits 300 defense with 147 HP, which means that physical hits kind of bounce off of this guy. Paint Split is a tool that allows it to recover, and with its naturally low HP, it makes it so, you know, because the HP stats get averaged and then they both get, you know, half of that, this thing just drains things of HP when it goes for Paint Split while recovering most of its HP off. So yeah, that is insane. Um, on top of that, it has a lot of tools at its disposal. Uh, Will-O-Wisp is great for burning opponents. Uh, Bulldoze is an option for activating Dynamax uh, weakness policy Pokemon. And Shadow Sneak is another option that we saw in previous formats where it was run next to Dragapult and Mimikyu on that triple ghost core, which I believe was series five. It might've been series seven though, uh, which allows it to activate the weakness policy on Dragapult. And on top of that, it can't be flinched. So it's very, uh, <laughs> or it can't be fake out flinched uh, because it's ghost type, which means it's very reliable for getting off Trick Room uh, as long as there's no taunt users. Uh, and you know, with the weakness policy stuff, you can't actually avoid that. So yeah, I mean, it has other tools as well. We've seen Disable on occasion. We've seen Brick Break Dusclops next to things like Lapras to activate weakness policy or even Glacier uh, to act activate that weakness policy and also deal with Grimmsnarl screens. So it has no shortage of tools. I think one of the biggest ones uh, that's slept on at the moment is Haze, which allows it to undo other Pokemon stat changes. And obviously it's partner stat changes as well if they're negative. Uh, so just being able to negate like special defense boost or weakness policy boost is absolutely huge for this thing. And you might think, well, yeah, how's it going to defend itself um, with that 70 base attack and 60 base special attack? Now, Dusclops actually has decent damage output because of Nightshade. Being able to deal a consistent 50 damage to Pokemon in VGC actually isn't terrible. Nightshade is just a great way of chipping at Pokemon consistently. And in the end game, when other Pokemon struggle to KO Dusclops, if, especially if it's been next to like a Dynamax Pokemon that went for Max Quake or Steel Spikes, they're going to have trouble KOing it. And then you can just Nightshade them to death and you're good to go. So yeah, Dusclops is a phenomenal Pokemon. It's been good since the beginning of Sword and Shield. And even when Porygon 2 came out, we still saw Dusclops see heavy usage in the game. So it's not a Pokemon that's going to be leaving anytime soon. So what is it being compared to here? Dusknoir, the fully evolved form, is pretty bad. And I guess I should talk about Frisk real quick. Frisk is invaluable in best of one and in best of three. Being able to identify things like weakness policy uh, before it gets procced, being able to identify safety goggles before you have to put a sleep powder into it for no reward, being able to identify focus sash before you double into it uh, is absolutely huge. Especially in best of one, which, you know, we're playing a lot of considering uh, real life events are not, you know, at least not official ones are happening yet. Dust Noir has that. It has that as well. That's essentially the only thing I can really give to it. There are a couple of other things I could talk about Dust Noir with. Uh, the main thing I want to highlight here is its coverage. 
Now, Dust Noir has Ice Punch, Poltergeist, Brick Break, Fire Punch, which I believe Dust Cops has access to as well, but Dust Noir has 30 more attack with a base attack of 100. So it does decent damage, but it isn't enough to justify using Dust Noir. Like I said, Dust Cops has pretty consistent damage output with Nightshade, and that damage output can't be lowered through Intimidate, Will O Wisp, Snarl, anything like that. So while Dust Noir has good damage output and good coverage, you can like Dynamax this thing and sometimes one shot a Landorus with Expert Belt max hailstorm you know um the benefits of dust cops just outweigh the benefits of dust noir especially when you consider that this thing only really has slight buffs to its bulk so dust cops 40 hp 130 defense 130 special defense dust noir 45 hp 135 special defense 135 physical defense it literally has a total of 15 more points of uh, uh, on its bulk overall five on each stat that isn't enough to outclass dust Clops's insane 50 percent boost after investment so yeah uh it's pretty hard to justify using dust noir it does everything dust Clops does but worse except for damage output on occasion and coverage it's really just hard to use this thing let me know if you guys have any ideas for how to use dust noir i would love to hear you out because it is one of my favorite pokemon uh from gen 4 so let me know let me know. I just want to see if you guys have any good ideas for this guy. Comment section, do your thing. But yeah, uh, Riolu, next Pokemon I want to talk about. Now, Riolu and Lucario play completely differently, while Dusclops and Dusnoir sort of have a thematic through line of consistent damage, possible Trick Room, uh, possible Ally Switch, I suppose, and just, you know, being bulky. These guys have nothing in common. <laughs> I'm going to keep it with you. They have nothing in common. So Riolu. Uh, Riolu saw pretty consistent usage pretty much ever since Isle of Armor came out. Uh, and it was never high usage. It was just high enough to be notable and for you to need to know what it is on Team Preview. Its main thing that it does is run coaching and copycat. Coaching being a brand new move in Generation 8, especially, I mean, specifically in the Isle of Armor, uh, that raises the allies' attack stat and defense stat by one stage each, which can be huge in Dynamax format. It allows you to eat hits well while also dealing more damage. Using this thing next to like Metagross or Glacier makes those things an absolute menace. And the reason it's so good on Riolu in particular, other Pokemon kind of struggle to fit coaching onto a moveset uh, over other options, uh, is Riolu's access to Prankster, which means that it can get like at minimum two of these things off uh, and save a Pokemon from getting KO'd in most cases, or even just essentially give it a permanent helping hand with that attack boost. So yeah, it's a really good, it's a really good tool for Riolu to have. Uh, we saw a lot of Riolu next to Glacier in like early series seven, and we saw Riolu next to things like Calyrex Ice in series eight. So yeah, uh, Copycat is a very valuable tool in Dynamax format because in Dynamax format, if you were to click Max Guard off of Trick Room specifically, Copycat reads that as Trick Room being the last move used. But And because um, Max Guard has priority, it means that Copycat from Prankster Riolu is most likely going to happen right after that Max Guard happens. So you essentially have a priority Trick Room, which is a new mechanic to Generation 8 because of the way Dynamax interacts with that move. So being able to get off priority Trick Room and then going for like coaching or whatever, or if you were running it next to Calyrex Ice, getting that priority Trick Room off and then bullet punching yourself to activate a weakness policy made this thing insane and if you survive those two turns then you can just start clicking coaching it was a really powerful pokemon that gives you a lot of momentum once it gets going and you would typically run this thing with a focus sash over eviolite because its bulk isn't really good enough to run eviolite effectively so you know if you're running this thing might as well just max out the attack since you can get a little bit more damage off with bullet punch or if you wanted to you could run like vacuum wave as an alternative to bullet punch to activate weakness policies on steel types i suppose so yeah, uh, it, had, it has a lot of tools in that sense. Uh, there really aren't many other things you'd want to run on this guy. It's usually the same moveset over and over again. Uh, you could run Helping Hand. You could run Faint. I, it gets Howl, which is kind of cool. Howl is actually a really nice move that I've used a couple of times. I don't believe it gets Taunt. It does not. So yeah, typically the moveset you're going to see is going to be like Detect, Coaching, Copycat, and then some kind of offensive priority move. So Riolu, seen a lot of usage with Prankster stuff. Lucario loses Prankster, which, I mean, it gets a pretty good ability in Inner Focus. I mean, Riolu gets it too, but uh, Inner Focus is actually a really nice ability for Lucario, which 
lets it have a little bit, a little bit of a niche in the format. Uh, before we get into that though, I'm going to talk about the wrong way to lose, <laughs> to use Lucario. And you might be thinking, oh, well, Marcos, there is no wrong way. Uh, in my opinion, Justified Lucario is just a spit in the face to Cobalion. Cobalion outclasses this thing in so many ways, especially with max airstream bulk and just the tools that it has at its disposal. The really the only reason they're the only tools this thing that has over Cobalion is Meteor Mash is a little bit stronger uh, than Iron Head. Uh, extreme Speed is a cool move and you have Ice Punch, but Max Airstream just makes it so if you're going to use a Justified Pokemon, if you're going to beat up a, a Steel Fighting type, just use Cobalion. It's usually better because of the speed boosting and the naturally higher speed and bulk. Just, just do that. So with that little tangent out of the way, Lucario has Inner Focus, which means in Generation 8, it can't be intimidated and it can't be flinched, which is huge. Most people will respect the inner focus as soon as they see that their Incineroar has not intimidated this thing, they won't bother with the fake out. They'll get out of there because they don't want to get one shot by close combat. This actually gives you opportunity to slap a focus ash on this thing and go for Swords Dance and then start dealing damage. Plus two extreme speed coming off a 110 attack is actually a pretty decently strong move. Meteor Mash deals a decent amount of damage, it allows you to hit Togekiss pretty hard and you naturally outspeed that thing. Uh, 90 base speed isn't a terrible speed tier, it's just okay. And close combat as a stab move while being unable to be intimidated is actually pretty huge. If you wanted to, you could probably drop extreme speed for like Ice Punch to deal with Landris a little bit better. However, um, you're only going to be outspeeding like Adamant Landris since Jolly Landris outspeeds you by one point, which is a little bit of a shame. So yeah, Lucario essentially only has in a niche in the format in the fact that it's a steel fighting type that can deal with both Incineroar and Togekiss that can't be intimidated or flinched. So that on paper, that sounds really good, but when you compare it to faster steel fighting types, you know, Cobalion uh, or just other Pokemon in general, it's hard to find room for it on a team. That's not to say it's not viable. I mean, the other day I was using the Cynthia theme team on the channel, which if you haven't seen that video, check it out, it was fire. Uh, and the focus actually Lucario actually was pretty okay. It's it's like a decent Pokemon. It's not ideal, but it's, it's an okay Pokemon. So yeah. Uh, that's my thoughts on Lucario and Riolu. Next up is Clefairy and Clefable, which I get this question all the time. Marcos, why are people using Clefairy over Clefable? Don't they have like the same tools? Isn't Clefable bulkier? Well, no, it's not. So Clefairy has, also it has, you know, one extra tool. Clefairy has access to this insane ability called Friend Guard, which essentially, as long as Clefairy is on the field, the allies that Clefairy has take 75% of the damage that they would have normally. That is a one-fourth reduction in damage, which is huge in Dynamax format. It does such a big difference when it comes to living hits. And Clefairy has access to really useful tools like Follow Me and Helping Hand to redirect hits and just make sure the Pokemon next to it is dealing a ton of damage. Uh, and it also has access to some support moves like Icy Wind and Protect to keep it on the field uh, a few extra turns, which with Friend Guard, that's a pretty big deal. Obviously, you can run other moves in this slot. If you have trouble dealing with Kartana, maybe you can run a more physically defensive set and run like Flamethrower as a little tech move. It's not ideal. Usually this is what you're going to want to run. I have seen some Moonblast Clefairy to, you know, deal, I mean, over Icy Wind, obviously. I have seen some Moonblast Clefairy to deal with um, Dragon types and just have a decent stab move to hit things with. Since 60 isn't completely unusable, you can hit things pretty hard with a base 95 move. Um, so it, it kind of, you know, just compensates for that. But I'm more of a fan of Icy Wind because that speed control is absolutely huge. So yeah, the reason you use Clefairy is follow me, Helping Hand, and Friend Guard above all else. And with the Eevee Light, you're actually slightly bulkier than Clefable, just slightly, but it makes a pretty big difference. And I did not mean to do that. So uh, what does Clefable do that Clefairy can't? In my opinion, if you're going to run Clefable and you don't want to just regret not running Clefairy, you might as well just go ahead and run Life Orb Offensive because it gets some pretty good coverage. Clefairy uh, used to be a normal type in Gen 1 and, you know, previous Gens before Gen 6, which means it gets insane coverage. It gets Fire, Grass, it gets Psychic, it gets Fairy, it gets Ghost, <laughs> it gets Electric. It has a lot of things it can do. But above all else, you're probably still going to want to run Follow Me for the utility it provides. Uh, being able to hide a life orb behind magic guard means that you can deal deceptively high damage despite its special attack only being 95. 
uh, you essentially just get that free 30% boost. You don't take the life orb damage. You don't take damage from anything that isn't a move. So burn won't do anything. Hail won't do anything. Um, toxic won't do anything. You don't have to worry about damage that isn't from a move specifically. So, you know, just having that coverage to one shot things like Lander's Therian, uh, being able to deal major damage with Moonblast, possibly being able to throw off a flamethrower against something like uh, a Rillaboom or a Kartana uh, makes this thing actually somewhat usable. However, if you're going to run a support Pokemon, you're going to want to go with Clefairy most of the time, pretty much specifically because of Friend Guard. So yeah, those are my thoughts on Clefairy and Clefable. Personally, I think it's pretty obvious why you would use the lower evolved form, even if they don't do the exact same thing like in uh, Lucario and Riolu's case, you're more likely to see the lower evolved form of these uh, three pairs in any given competitive battle because of how viable they are in their specified role. So let me know if you guys learned anything new in this video. Uh, like I said, this is more aimed towards a newer to competitive audience. However, if you're, you know, someone who already knew all this and you just wanted to watch to support, I appreciate you. Maybe you just like the sound of my voice. So yeah, let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Leave a like if you enjoyed, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.